Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Ernest Wilkins, and I'm the Senior Programming Strategist for Chicago Ideas. On behalf of the Chicago Ideas team, I'd like to thank you for attending today's conversation. I'd like to now introduce our host for today's event. Brian Babylon is a Chicago-born comic and radio host. Self-proclaimed Prince of Bronzeville has been a fixture in Chicago's comedy community for years. He also has been a very frequent um, friend and collaborator with the Chicago Ideas family, so we love him a lot. Uh, Brian is going to be your host for today's really fun and exciting conversation. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, Brian Babylon. Boom. Thank you, Ernest Wilkins, my friend, and welcome to conversation with Diallo. Uh, Bashir and myself about comedy. Let's enter. Let's bring up on the Alan Bashir. Hey guys. Hey. Boom. And there he is, Bashir and Diallo. Hey. hey. What's up, man? How y'all doing, doing, man? Good, good, good. Good. As usual, now, my before camera's we just... perfect. Here we go. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. Uh, you know what? It's so funny. I sent Ernest a picture that came up. Facebook reminded me it was one year ago that we were all in the green room at Windy City Live. That's right. Windy just, City Live. Just Windy City Live. When the, when the show first came out, you guys, boom, there it is. We were all in the green <laughs> <laughs> Seems like, like a whole, whole different t-shirt. era. <laughs> yeah. That's, That's so crazy, crazy to think about what a... No, yeah, people just hugging, no six yeah. feet. Yeah. No. It's sort of like a, a good old fashioned black cookout. Mm -hmm. It's a different world. So a year a year later, uh, first thing I want to say is congratulations on the South Side. You know, we talked about it at Ideas Week um, last October. Um, it was a great season, a lot of buzz, a lot of people were talking about it. Um, the business question I want to ask both of you is how does one get season two? in this very competitive world of cable TV and keeping people's attention in this ADD world we live in? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, you know what, the, the, this is Bashir. Uh, the, the formula that networks use to decide whether or not to pick up another season of a show is actually something that they keep pretty close to the vest. So as creators, all you can really do is, is give yourself great odds. Uh, for us, we did that with great ratings. I think Southside, uh, actually was the number one new uh, cable show in black households, um, mm. which was incredible for us because, you know, we wanted everybody to watch and everybody did watch it. But, you know, especially uh, black folk just loved it and, and really loved what we were doing. And, and we're so excited to see like the take that we had and the level of specificity of Chicago and then the quality of the jokes. I mean, a lot of the writers put all our energy into just like trying to make sure that every episode is as funny as humanly possible. And that there's jokes coming at you all the time from every angle. And, and the fans really loved it and appreciated it. So, you know, we had really strong ratings. Um, the critical reviews were outstanding. We had 100% uh, Rotten Tomatoes. You know, the, the you know I think it was the Sun-Times, their article they reviewed, they were like, okay, the only question we have is when is season two coming out? And this is before the show premiered. So, you know, we uh, combined great ratings with a wonderful TV show because sometimes the networks to their credit will pick up a show that doesn't have great ratings, but it's like just a really great TV show and they just believe that the audience will come. Um, but we had that too. And then we also had the critical buzz. And I think all those things Comedy Central put into their, you know, uh, you know, their, their calculus and they figured out, yeah, let's do this again. So we felt pretty strongly that we were going to get a second season just by the response. I mean, I think Comedy Central reported that even in the Chicago area, you know, their viewing was up 400%. And for us, that was like the best thing because it was like, we really wanted a show that everybody loved, but especially that Chicago looked at, saw itself and felt really good about it. And I'm, I'm so proud that the city of Chicago loves the show. So I do think that it's like a little bit of a, a sometimes stuff that should get picked up doesn't, and you never know yeah. why and then vice versa happens. So, I mean, I have never been one of those like meetings, but I do think that the best way to get picked up is probably just to have a really strong rating, rating success. But I will so, say, yeah, that I, I think that it's, you know, to the listeners who are out there, like, there is no set standard. Yep. You know, there have been things that had great ratings that got canceled for contractual reasons. There are yep. things that uh, don't get ratings that get brought back. You really do have to have the support of the network. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we had a strong relationship with the previous president of Comedy Central. And, you know, I think that, you know, if 
even if we had not achieved the ratings that we had achieved, I think that they believed in what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's 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 the sort of atmosphere that I think that uh, really leads to season two pickups. Let me ask, let me ask, let me throw this to you, Diallo. Do you think uh, success can come from just having a strong black audience or do you have to, you know, sure have a good black strong audience, but have that slight ability to kind of quote unquote cross over or can you, can you survive just on black audiences alone? I'm going to say no. You know, I was on a, I was on an NBC show that had great ratings and they, they effectively killed it. You know, like yeah. there's a, there's a thing in this business where most of the presidents of these uh, companies are not black and you can have like a lot of black people watching, but it just floats under the radar of, you know, it, it can float under the radar of the, of the wrong people, including the president of your network. So there is a world in which you can have a lot of black people loving your show. I, I'll put it like this. Every time a black show gets canceled, you find out on Twitter, like, damn, that was like everybody's favorite show where I'm living. And mm -hmm. it's just, and, 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 and conversely, like we were just saying, you know, sometimes there'll be some of these white shows with not that great of ratings, but the president of the network or the yep. channel is a big fan. And so he's like, well, I like it. And they'll give it a chance and they'll give it real promotion. You know, that's another thing that doesn't get talked about a lot in this business, which is that, you know, black shows don't often get the promotion that we deserve, uh, you know, because marketing dollars are prioritized by the people at the top. And so they're gonna prioritize mm -hmm. what they like and culturally what they like might not be what we like. So well, you know, let me ask you something about that. I mean, I'll throw it to both of you. Do you think, Sure, you have network marketing dollars, but as showrunners, is there a way to sort of make quote unquote black Twitter work for you or black social media or social media work for you to be another marketing component to make a show successful? I think you know that. I think having black Twitter be in your corner is, is I think one of the best ways to, to let the networks know that the show is buzzing because they do track that now, you know. I never forget when me and Diallo wrote uh, the ESPYs one year that I went downstairs after the show, they were all going crazy. And there was literally a room full of people at computers just looking at the metrics on social media. They were saying, how yeah. many mentions did this part get? How many mentions did that part get? And I literally talked to some like, you know, computer science person who was speaking way above my head, but was, was explaining to me like, you know, you guys' numbers on this, 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 this special were so great. And, you know, you should see these bumps in the metrics and what have you. And so I know that they do put that into the calculation, you know, when they're, you know, when they're trying to figure out like what to do next. But the, you know, the fact that if a show is really buzzy and if when it comes on and starts trending and tw and Twitter and especially Black Twitter is going cra going crazy for it, you know, that can only help you. And I think that should help you because if it's a show that they're going crazy for, there's quality. It's a good show, and like you just like the just says, sometimes it's not always reflected in the in the numbers. But you know, networks also look at like the ability of Twitter. To, to give a show resonance and to give a show a life past the original air date, right? So if everybody's talking about it, you know, the numbers on premiere, might, premiere night might not be great, but then as you go out over the course of the week and you look at seven days out, who's watching it on DVR and who's like looking at it because people are reading their Twitter feed and they're going, everybody's talking about this. I want to see what this is about. It certainly helps you in the long run. And so, you know, absolutely. We're, I'm really proud of, of, you know, kind of like what our mentions were doing when our show was on the air and, and it really, they it's were also strong, cool to kind man. of see that. Yeah, it's kind of cool to see that conversation happening and to see people kind of pick up on. It's really exciting to see people pick up on the small things that we did on the show. And people would be like, "Oh, did you notice this? Did you notice that?" And we're like, "Oh my God, they noticed it. That's so cool." Uh, but yeah, that that Twitter love is, is is actually fairly crucial, especially nowadays. So let me ask you this: uh, I'm, I'm going to do an analogy. Mm -hmm. Right now, in my heart, I feel, and I'm not going to say which one is which. You mm -hmm. got you two are now the Scotty and Mike of. Uh, Black guys showrunners. You guys know how That's to awesome. win championships, be successful, bring home them chips, do that Trophies. thing. Trophies. 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 Now, uh, Bashir, you're <laughs> from Chicago. <laughs> oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. What are you going to say? I, I was saying, Bashir, you're from Southside Chicago. Yes, sir. Diallo, you're from, you from Atlanta. And I lived, you know, I'm from Chicago, Prince of Bronzeville, Southside represent. But I went to school. Uh, in Atlanta at Clark mm. Atlanta University. So I know both styles of black. And if you, you know, you can get real, you know, you can get real, 
real legit if you come for both of those energies. Yeah. Do you think, you know, that helps cultivate and sort of uh, creates sort of the tapestry that you make to create black content? Or, or is it fair to say, hey, man, I don't make black content. I just make content. What, what, what would you say? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll jump in there first. I think that I think that there are a lot of similarities between Atlanta and Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just in terms of like there being like these large middle class black neighborhoods, and also just how you know you can go to a go to a school and the valedictorian is black, and you know some of the thugs are black, but you know some of the smartest kids are black, some of the just unruly kids are black. Like in a weird way, it makes like being black sort of, I don't want to say secondary, but it's not the first thing that comes to mind when you, as when like you grow up in like an interracial uh, environment where yeah. like, oh, those are the black kids, those are white kids. Like all of a sudden, like you really get to find your identity. And I think mm-hmm. that if you take, if you take the fact that Bashir and I both come from very large black families and you pair that with the fact that we both sort of came to the black community a little bit as outsiders, you know, like my family, you know, we didn't go to church growing up. Like we were what? Part of that. Yeah, I'm serious. Like we were part of that <laughs> intellect. We were part of that like rapidly intellectual. Um, you know, I would, I would, I would throw. You know, without naming any names, but like it's just like that that uh, Juan Caranga black militancy. Like you know that yeah. that anything that was more. Uh, I won't say it's our religion because we're religious, but we didn't go to church. We weren't churchgoers in the in the bible belt since um, if i can hop in I, I would say would you say like atlanta was you know and i was there in, in, in the mid 90s was woke before woke was woke and i mean I it, atlanta it, was quote unquote more woke than chicago in, in some ways because they had each other the community and all that kind of stuff well i was gonna say there were just places to find your identity outside of what is typically considered like you know black so like you know my mm-hmm. family I remember our religious exposure was to a church called the Black of the, the the Shrine of the Black Madonna, which was a was which was almost like a black nationalist church, um, you know. And and I just to complete that thought I had earlier, like Bashir's family, uh, you know, they, they they were Muslims, and and in the black community, we know the black Muslims. You know what I'm saying? Like that's not a strange thing, but it is still a little bit of an outsider's perspective on the community since so many of us are 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 typically Christian. So I say all that just to say that the thing I always liked about Atlanta and Chicago and just those pockets of, of black people and black communities is that nobody forces you into a pocket. Nobody requires that you be a certain way or think a certain way. To a certain extent, we were able to identify, we were able to come up with our, you know, and create our own identities mm-hmm. within the general black population. And I think that's, you know, I think that's something that makes those cities special. You know, I think we always set out to make, just quite simply, the funniest show humanly possible. We set out to turn Chicago, specifically the south side of Chicago, into Springfield from The Simpsons. Like, there's so many characters, there's so many points of view, there's so many different ideas going back and forth. I think for us, the fact that we're Black means that it's going to be Black. But I do think that something you talked about earlier is at play. I think that people who watch our show kind of get from it what they want to get from it. So some people watch it and go, this is a great Black show. Other folks watching and go, this is just a goddamn great comedy. And we're happy for all those people to watch our show. We want every single type of American to be able to tune in and, and laugh with us. And, and you know, we want to welcome them into, like the Alice said, we're from big families. And I think with Southside, we've created a big TV family. And we want to welcome mm-hmm. everybody in. We want everybody to have a good time. Because I think that's rare nowadays. It's rare to, to watch something that you feel like allows so many different types of folks to enjoy it. And, and I think that's important to us because like Diallo said, you know, especially, you know, coming from uh, uh, these black communities, we didn't sectionalize ourselves and, you know, go like, oh, these are these types of, of, of black people and those types of black people. That's a great still watching me <laughs> <laughs> as I talk about that. But like, we just had fun with it. And we, and you know, it's like the idea that there could be a black point of view, I think was something that neither of us was raised with. We were raised with just like like the Owl's parents and my parents were both like, you know, you gotta be good in school. You need to be trying to be a high achiever. You need to be trying to do all these things. And and your identity is wrapped up into all of them, but it was never presented as like you have to service this identity as the only important thing. You know, you know? one thing that we yeah. that Peter and I both love is coming to America. 
mm-hmm. and coming to America has, you know, McDowell, who's a small business owner, and Sam Jackson robbing the place. Like, yeah, us, that was the sort of like cultural milieu, if you if you will. Is that, did I mispronounce that? Milieu. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> See, some of us say as well, educated uh, you need to be. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> sort of milieu that we were trying to create with uh, Southside was just like you know, let's show. Let's show all the different wonderful types of black people. Mm-hmm. So do you think like moving forward is <clears throat> 2020, you know, things were way different. You know, I guess my backdrop is one of the, I guess people will say the the heyday of black shows. It was a different world, Cosby show, you know, then the nineties you had Living Single and, mm-hmm. you know, and now in 2020, you know, you have black programming, but mm-hmm. your show, I would say is my kind of go-to to fight. Oh, I see myself on TV. You know, mm. I will say I have no shame in saying that uh, I am a Greenleaf addict. Uh, Greenleaf Love is Greenleaf. a show about is a, in the emphasis. You know, I'm not an, I'm not a, in the church, but I like to see high production value, some yeah. drama, and it's like, hey, it's like Black People Dynasty. Same thing, drama, yeah. And, yeah, exactly. and it's and it's good. It's a good time. Do you think the way that your show other shows on TV is now shaping the way people see people that look like us in the media. Because when you go overseas, like when I was a kid, I would go overseas. They only thought black people were from what they saw on TV and it was super narrow. Mm -hmm. Do you think now that, you know, we have this information, you know, swirling around how we're seen is changing or is it the same old game? No, I, I think I think we definitely are in a period. We're in a moment. We'll probably look back on this moment because let's be honest, at some point there's going to be a backslide and there probably won't be as many sort of like black shows on the air as there are right now. But like, well, right now, why do you think that? Yeah, because, uh, I, you know, oh, I, think this, I think this city. Look, I think that they 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 go in waves, right? Like, I'm not saying it'll ever go back to the early 2000s where you couldn't find anybody but, you know, my wife and kids, but uh, I do think that things go in waves, and I think right now we just you know that there is a there is a good wave right now. You know, I, I love the the work that Issa uh, and Robin and Donald Glover, and I, I think right now it's like I, I was telling your producer, I'm I'm watching P Valley, like you know, like that show is actually so well shot. Like I just yeah. look at the scenes, I'm like, man, this looks so expensive, and I don't think it's an expensive show. Uh, I just think that you know the <clears throat> It's such right now that you can actually make things look really good if you have, you know, competent people. And one thing that Bashir and I really shoot for is to have, you know, talented black actors and actresses in front of the camera, but also the talented black cameramen, talented, you know, black uh, producers, producers and producers ADs. And and... Producers. Yeah, like, you know, his <clears throat> his brother actually has an organization that's all about that that we'll probably hopefully get to talk mm-hmm. about at some point because I think that you know, right now is just a special moment. Right now, I'm seeing so many different types of black stories and so many well shot, well edited, well written, uh, well acted pieces that I, that I feel, you know, I'm, I'm in a good place. But I think one thing well, that, that, oh, oh, go ahead. And I'm gonna throw this to you, Bashir, in a second. Oh. Do you, and it's kind of the, to piggyback what Diallo said, will we go back, go back? I feel maybe not, and this is, this is a debate, because, you know, in the 2000s, in the 80s and the 90s, you didn't have the bandwidth. There was just the networks, there was no cable, there was no streaming devices. Now the pool is open where they're scrambling for content. So maybe if there's quality content and there's a market for it, there's a place for it. But mm-hmm. what do you think about that? I think I could. I was gonna say the same thing, I agree. I think the reason Diallo said it goes in waves is because that's what's happened in the past. You know, We watched the Cosby mm-hmm. show. I remember watching A Different World and being like, if this is on TV, it's over, game is over. This is the new standard. Yeah. We're going to have these really great, smart, and by the way, laugh out loud, funny, new voices in comedy. There's so many new voices on that show who, like, you didn't even know who they were. Like, I'm thinking about the guy who played, um, you know, Ron, Dwayne Wade's roommate, you know, uh, like, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Jasmine Guy, you know, who, who probably doesn't get a lot of love as a comedy actor, but is, like, laugh out loud, funny, Thank and, like, you. throws haymakers comedically, right? Like, she was throwing punches. And connecting. She was and being, doing Lucy level stuff, man. He was she doing was Lucy, on the Lucy level work. work. Thank but you. It, but because yes. of what what the I was talking about is because of the fact that they had to program time slots, things come and go, and they come and go, and they come and go. So after the Cosby Show and after 
uh, different world came, I expected there to be just permanently great stuff on TV that had a variety of different levels. And that wasn't the case, right? It seemed like everything went away. Then it all came back again with UPN. And there was like a bunch of good shows and really funny shows and new comedy voices. And then that seemed to go away. And I think what you said is exactly right. I think that because of streaming, because things live forever, I believe that you're, this is the first time in history that things could kind of stay the way they are. I think this is the only, I think this is a new terrain and a new shot specifically because of streaming. And to that point, uh, my wife was telling me yesterday that I think Netflix just bought a whole bunch of UPN shows. They bought like yep. Parker, like, the game, like and the game. One. Yeah. I promise you those shows are going to be heavily watched and they're going to be in heavy rotation because when people get those shows on Netflix, they just leave them on. They binge them and that's all they yep. watch over and over again. And so for us, <clears throat> actually one of the difficulties with Southside was like, we would get all this love. I mean, even at the start of COVID, Jada Pinkett put out this like, tweet where she was like, I want to talk about my favorite TV shows. And she mentioned Southside. And sadly, in the comments, it was like, all right, where do we watch this? Oh, you got to get the Comedy Central app. And then you got to download the mm-hmm. link to the bloom, bloom, yeah. bloom. And it's like, you know, it, it, there should not be any barrier between the audience and the material. And I think places like Netflix and HBO Max have made sure that that's the case, that there is no barrier. Um, and so that's sort of like the thing that has changed. And, and I'm really optimistic and hopeful that you know, a lot of these great shows can now just live forever and be, be built forever because this, there's finally an architecture to support that. And it's not like, you know, the other thing I was going to say really quickly is I always felt like, and I don't really have any proof of this, but I always felt like networks use black shows to bring in the audience. And yep. then once the audience is there, they get rid of the black shows because I seem to remember the Fox network when Fox first started, and I'm old enough to remember that it was a ton of black shows on Fox. And then... Yep. All of it, then they had a bunch of new fans and then Living Color was like leading the charge, right? They were the first TV show that like beat the Super Bowl. Literally because of it Living Color, the Super Bowl was like, all right, the next year we gotta get Michael Jackson because we can't have a black comedy taking all the viewers away from the Super Bowl during halftime, right? They literally took all the viewers and then they all went back, you know, when the game started again. Mm-hmm. You know, and so it kind of was going like that. And, and, and but they had, they had white, right? They had Living Color and Martin mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. WB came along, and then they had a bunch of black shows. WB was all black. It was just crazy. Yeah, yeah it was. It was all yeah. black. And then, and now well, look, look at it. Look, yeah, look at the CW today, and there's like a black dude on maybe ju- you know that Justice League show. Like mm-hmm. no, they, Black Lightning is about it. Get, yeah, you know some viewers, and then once they have you know a crossover hit, uh, they t- listen. I, I I hope y'all are right. I think that there is a world in which streaming keeps you know, black people with options for the rest of our time. I would point out that like, um, you know, and this gets a little bit into the to the business of Hollywood, but you know, I, I personally don't know the effect that COVID will have on streaming. I mean, like mm. right now, Spectrum, you know, the cable company has a streaming platform and they're buying shows, but you can't ever That's know. Crazy. It's That's hard to predict when the gold that. rush is over. Yeah. There's something like 600 shows in production, whereas in yeah. I think 2008 there were 150, 200. So right now we're operating at the, like this huge capacity. Everybody, you know, who's already in is working, and they're mm-hmm. and, and they're doing shows. I just don't want to assume that five years from now, especially with with COVID and and, and political unrest, that we're still in an environment where everybody thinks that their play is streaming. Because I do think, you know, Netflix. Netflix will be there 10 years from now, obviously. Um, yeah. It'll be interesting to see which of its competitors are there in 10 years. Well, you know what I call that? I call that the Quibi bubble. The Quibi <laughs> bubble. You know, hey, it's hey, like, hey, we'll great see. Great article. There's a great, and by the way, it's on Quibi. I, look, I got friends who chose the Quibi. <laughs> there's a great article, that's, the, the headline was great. It was like, uh, why laughing at Quibi is more fun than laughing at laughing at Quibi shows. <laughs> like, it's, it's insane to me. Um, the bad timing because that that platform was created for people who are going to be on their commute on yep. the train mm-hmm. getting in the dmv waiting to be helped like right now nobody's going to be at home with like your big flat screen tvs and stuff looking at something on, yeah, your, and phone you're on your phone way. the yep. same way so well, it's just, uh, timing's incredible let me ask you let me ask you guys this question about the business we'll talk about some comedy people have some questions they want to um sure. Uh, ask us. Uh, I'm Brian Babylon. We got my man Bashir, the Yellow creators of Sherman Showcase and so Comedy sorry. Central Show Southside. Um, speaking of Hollywood, I, and I did a real snarky post on Facebook. I do those once a week, and people were just cheering and clapping about all the uh, Black Emmy nominations mm. that came out. And I'm happy for Issa, Yvonne, all that. Mm-hmm. But I said 
of course Hollywood is going to do a knee jerk situation like that mm -hmm. when everyone's in their black feelings. I want to go be just, behind just the scenes. Black people. And, <laughs> yeah, I want to go yeah. behind the scene and see who's craft service, like you said, who's a grip, who's this, who's that. And it goes back to we talked about your brother's non for profit uh, in 44. October, yeah. where they're just trying to get kids into production, knowing how to grip, knowing how to do yeah. audio, know how to do yeah. production. Do you think that is when things will really even out and you actually get better content when you have more diverse people behind the scenes as well? I think better content is here. I think, you know, the shows you mentioned are outstanding. And I think that I'm so proud of those show creators for getting, mm -hmm. for getting that stuff out there. I do think that the number of black faces on a set does hopefully help producers and writers feel like that they have a bigger, um, a bigger uh, a mandate to do something that is more inclusive. But I will say for me, you know, my brother's organization, Lane 44, which Dial and I love and support, is trying to get more black people, you know, to work on some of those jobs behind the scenes. I'll, I'll tell you why, because I never forget when Dial and I wrote for Late Night with Jimmy Fallon, there was this camera guy who used to tell us, he said, hey man, when I die and I come back, I want to come back as a camera guy. And what he, what he was trying to say was like, their lives are so much better than people think. I mean, these guys have incredible pension. And, and I want to say guys and girls, it's still mostly guys. That is changing. I was on a show Glow that had a tremendous amount of uh, both female and trans members behind the camera. But for, for now, it still tends to be mostly guys. But again, they have great pensions. Their union is incredibly strong. I'm a big union guy. Shout out to all the unions. You know, and it's it just like a lifestyle. And then unfortunately, or fortunately, it's a lot of nepotism in it, right? A lot of camera guys, especially in New York, will straight up pass that job right down to you know, teenage brothers and cousins and uncles who are coming up and you'll go to some TV shows and be like, man, the father and the son both work behind the camera yeah. or in the, in the cue card department. But again, these are not jobs that we can't do and do well. And they're also incredibly sustaining. And if you do these jobs in Chicago, you will never be unemployed. There will never, between Dick Wolf and Dick Wolf, you will never not need a, a, a crew job in the city of Chicago. And so how do we become part of that Part of not just trying to sort of be people who are in front of the camera and, 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 and you know, hopefully succeeding there, but also taking advantage of the fact that the entertainment industry offers a lot of really stable, secure, and, and jobs people look forward to going to every day. I mean, let's be really real. A lot of the people who, who show up on the cruise, they like me, they'll show up in the morning, they have a really good breakfast, you know, yep. they'll do work, they'll be able to hang out with their friends. Most of us will come to work, I believe, in shorts and Crocs. You know, and, and when you see the price point and when you see what the actual salary is, you go, that's a great job. And so I'm really proud that, that my brother's leading the effort to make sure that we can be part of that. Not only does it provide opportunity for young folks to see a whole variety of different careers that they could thrive in, but you know, it's also an opportunity for them to do this instead of something that's less productive. And so we're really and, proud of that. Let me just say that, uh, you know, I think acting is obviously the most visible, yep. uh, you know, form of what we do, but I'd also think that um, it takes miracles to become an actor, you know, yeah. like, True. Good timing, talent, it takes so much. You know, I'm not saying that that's not the case for some of these other positions, but you know, you like Bashir said, you will work consistently. Uh, just you know, just given how the how this industry works, mm -hmm. you will work consistently. Yeah. I mean, there's 600 I mean, I shows. There's a lot of jobs. Like people who are you know, grips, electricians, and, and like they got really nice homes because their their work is more steady than the actor friends that yeah, I. Have. That's true. That's true. Oh yeah, you're always gonna work if you're behind behind the yeah. camera. Uh, yeah, you always work versus when, like when, a superstar actor. Dude, I'm gonna tell you what. When I I've done many shows. When the show is coming to an end, when the season is coming to an end, and you haven't heard the actors are shook. And I don't care. I, and I mean celebrities. I've been around them. They like, oh, what's coming next? I don't know. You know who's never shook is <laughs> hair and makeup is never shook. Uh, Grip Electric is never shook. Yeah, they always oh, roll. Props is never <laughs> shook. They're just like, oh, I got three more jobs lined up. I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta figure out what I'm doing next. You know what I'm saying? I gotta, I gotta plan a vacation so I don't take any jobs. Right? They have literally have to plan time to not take jobs. And I don't think people, yeah. you know, increasingly, especially people from the south side in our communities, they don't realize how great that is to have employment that is just so um, overwhelmingly, you know, ubiquitous. It's everywhere you go, there's a job for you. And I think that's that's something that's incredible once, that our industry has. Once we get back to work, though, once we get back to work, though, right now, the only that is the thing that's difficult right now. He's right. Our writers and, and animators. That's, yeah. that's really about it right yeah, now. Yeah, if you do animation right now, you're killing it. Yeah, that's animation. one of the killing things that can cool. shoot during COVID. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, like, I, have, I have some questions from uh, the people out in the uh, web it. world. Uh, this first question is, 
uh, your characters have a very self effacing quality that is very on brand for each of your personalities. Thank How you. much of that is intentional during your creative process? Wow. Um, I think for me, specifically with Officer Goodnight and with, you know, with Sherman Show, look, the Al and I have this incredible position where we get to define what our characters are. We didn't have to audition. I mean, in some ways, we had to audition these characters for the network, but we didn't have to show up to an audition and give them the take of these characters and say, I hope they like this take. But we put that much work into it behind the scenes. So behind the scenes, I know for Alan Gale and for Dutch on Sherman Showcase, Diallo spent a lot of time figuring out what is this character, what's funny about him. People text me ideas in the middle of the night. Oh my God, what if my guy has like an old school Mercedes drop top that's like five years too old, right? For, for the Alan Gale character. But like slowly but surely building this thing that he and his comedy instincts know will be funny. And then luckily for us, we're blessed enough, thank God, to have a platform to put it out there and we have enough experience to kind of know what has worked in the past and so he knows that this is going to work and then he also has a great sounding board in our writer room and in the producers on set to help him even do more tweaks uh and refinements to the character to make it great and i have the exact same thing you know i, I play opposite my wife she's probably the first person who saw officer good night in all its glory and we had this opportunity to kind of build it slow together and to figure out as a comedy actor for me like what makes me funny like what do i do that I know is is makes people laugh. I think we had the great experience of working at Fallon. So we were, you know, in front of an audience. Diallo had the really great experience of working on Marlon, where he literally is in front of a gigantic studio audience every night. And they'll tell you right off if it's funny or if it's like, gotta keep working on that. So we bring all that to, to you know that too as a comedian, you know, the audience is very honest. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so we were able to bring all those experience and help create characters that made us laugh and they made the audience laugh and just build them slowly but surely. But I think the idea that they were self-effacing and that we put that type of, I think that just comes naturally probably from the choices that we make. But I'm just excited yeah. that we were able to make something that, you know, when I'm watching dailies and the editor's dying laughing and, you know, we're showing this stuff. And then we did testing for the shows, but they did test audiences and the audiences went crazy for it. So I think for us, like our experience helped us just create the funniest thing we could to kind of work with what each of us bring to the table comedically. Uh uh, Dial, I'm gonna throw this to you. Well, both, I throw this to both of you. This next question is, and the person put a hashtag Whitney Young Dolphin Stand Up. So I don't, that could be Will Miles. Who knows who that is? Uh, <laughs> Why are you talking about Will Miles? Will, shout out to Will Miles. <laughs> I can't get away from Will Miles, baby. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, shout out Will. Congratulations. Congratulations, Will Miles. Shout out. Shout out. Uh, both both of you <clears throat> act right. Do any of you have a uh, desire to direct in the future? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, 100%. In absolutely. fact, I'm a little bit surprised we haven't pulled a Duffer Brothers uh, with Chowski's, like, yeah, where we with like, yeah. where we direct. Can I say something? You know, together. I'm surprised you guys haven't done that either. I'm yeah. I'm just as surprised you guys haven't hopped What's funny, though, is if, you come, if you're on our sets, I mean, we don't direct, but... If you were on our set and you were looking over at the uh, video village, you might think we're the directors. So, you know, whether it be Southside yeah. or Sherman's, if you look over, you'll see us literally talking to the actors about where they need to be, talking about the character motivations, talking about the comedy. I think that there's a technical side to directing that both of us kind of want to get better at because as a director, you kind of have to be able to look at a space, you walk into a room, look at a space, and you have to have the instinct and education to know where the camera goes depending on mm -hmm. who's talking and where it needs to go, depending on what the story needs. I think these are things that can be learned. I think these are things that I don't know yet. Uh, but both of us want to do it. I think, in, in fact, I believe season two of Southside, we were both talking about maybe doing an episode. But then the coronavirus is like, nah, stay home. Yeah. Well, Dial, do you, do you think, you know, when you guys do Southside or work together on Sherman Showcase, it's sort of like a three-headed monster director. You have the director who's sort of like, Okay, guys, I know where lights are, I know where cameras are, but there's sort of that other tentacle that needs to have the talent do what they do. Yeah. You guys think you kind of are directing, but maybe not action, that type we, of directing. We, we love our directors on both shows so much. Um, and mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say specifically in terms of Michael Blyden, we met him at Fallon. Amazing guy. Uh, he was directing everything at Fallon. We loved mm -hmm. working with him. He's one of these directors who brought just as much funny as we did you know yeah. like he's, and he's just got a weird <laughs> a weird brain that would come up with stuff that quite honestly Bashir and i wouldn't come up with so it was nice True. having that third brain on a show like Southside. and while i'll say that like i think thurman's whereas it's uh it's you you can see the the the, the 
the invisible director on Sherman's a little bit because it's so stylized. I think what Blyden does on, um, Michael Blyden is his name, what, what he does on Southside is almost genius in the fact that you don't always notice it, but I always notice it and Bashir always notice it because you know, he'll, he'll know whether it's funnier here as opposed to here. You know what I mean? Mm. Like he's, he, he, his camera and, and his team always find a way to, to frame the joke in the best possible way. And that's not always the thing. It's, it's like a solid supporting actor. Like it doesn't mm. always get the, the kudos that it deserves. But uh, mm. I, I, quite frankly, I thought that, uh, I thought given the scope of season one of Southside, it was my firm belief that he deserved a, an Emmy nomination for best directing of the comedy series. Cause yeah, and I, I think it was not easy. We had so many talking characters. It'd mm -hmm. be really easy to lose jokes or the geography of the scene. I don't think it ever happens. Nope. I think I'm blind with genius. And I think also the people we work with know that, that we're very collaborative. We come from big families. If you come from a big family, you got to be collaborative. You cannot be selfish. That does not work and you will not succeed. And so we already had the DNA of people who were collaborative. And then we picked directors who weren't just talented and, and weren't just like incredibly uh, visionary, but also were very collaborative, who, who welcome our input because they realized that our input was very valuable. And so in both cases, both directors will say, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And it really becomes a very healthy and cool discussion with a bunch of people just trying to get to the funniest thing. You know, I, I had a, a, the good fortune of doing an episode of Blackish and they had the same kind of vibe. They had directors and writers all huddled together trying to figure out what the best thing, what the funniest thing was. And I do think, especially in comedy, I don't know about drama, but in comedy, it's really important to have those other voices at Video Village pitching the director, pitching ideas, and continuing to talk about it because comedy is so collaborative. You know, stand-up comedian, that is probably the only part of comedy where it's one person doing one thing and they're funny and they got it and they're in charge. Whether it be comedy movies or, you know, and I've done a couple or comedy TV shows, it's a lot of other voices and a lot of other people coming together to figure out what the best way forward is and what's the funniest. And thing. you have to be open. You have to be open to hearing what's funny and doing because some and directors are not. I work with one. Di I won't say this person's name, but I did work with one director who was the exact opposite. Who was like, I don't want to hear pitches. I don't want to hear anything. This is where the camera goes. Don't do any improv. Boom, 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 boom. And I was like, oh, this, and how, this is different. And how was that? How was the end product for that? Uh, well, to be fair, it was it was award winning, but <laughs> I nah. think that was. <laughs> but that's one person who has yeah. developed their technique and is very specific. And when you work with that person, you choose to be specific with that person. But for the most part, it's it's so much better when, when, when people can talk and, you know, when people can listen to each other and really figure it all out together. And I think what, what you'll find, you know, for those of you who end up working in film and television, you'll find that on the biggest hit TV shows, the stars of the show are very involved. They're very involved with in the writing mm -hmm. and they're incredibly involved with the director on set because they know especially when you get to that level, they know how they're funny and how they're good and they want to make sure they're always trying to hit that. Uh, another question, how much material do you plan uh, for when you're in the writer's room? Is it for the episode or for that season? Or do you plan longer for, you know, or like, oh, that might not work for now, but ooh, that, that Harold's chicken mild sauce thing might need to do there or that bus, you know, yeah. do you, some things might not work in one, episode but you can kick it down the can or just keep it in in the queue how does that work you, you can take that one for sure that's that, that uh, i think it's both I, I i think that it all starts from openness it all starts from learning to be collaborative with other people why do i say that because then you listen to other people and you don't listen from the standpoint of let's be real there are some writer rooms especially in the past that were very cutthroat there are still some nowadays that are very cutthroat where a new writer will come in and be really funny, but nobody's laughing at the new writer because they're the new writer and, you know, pardon my language, but F them. I'm not going to be supporting some new person. I'm trying to get my jokes on the air. That is absolutely the thing that has happened and does, unfortunately, still happen. Some TV shows thrive on that. Our shows don't. Our shows are very collaborative. And the reason I say that is because somebody will pitch an idea and somebody else will say, not only is that funny, but we could also bring that back in season two as this other thing. And somebody goes, yeah. We... So the idea that if you pitch something, you know you're going to be supported and you know other people are going to pitch ways to make your idea expand and, and, and find ways to make your work even better. That comes really, and I'm really proud of one thing that Dial and I do, we really set a great tone in our writer rooms where everybody feels like they can contribute, that they will be yeah. heard and that they will be taken seriously. And when you create that environment, now all of a sudden you have a situation where Diallo, who was you know, really the vanguard, leading the vanguard on Sherman Showcase specifically, had a TV show that had great ideas 
wonderful moments. And then he and the writers begin to think about ways to tie it all together. So episode eight of Sherman Showcase is now greater than the sum of its parts, right? Because now we say, oh, what if there's this weird through line and it has to do with time travel? And that, that you know, I've definitely seen really creative ideas get killed in a writer room because somebody at the top was like, ah, I don't, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. But that's not oh, us. Yeah. And so when these ideas come up and somebody goes, hey, man, what if this character is actually a time traveler? And boom, boom, boom. Now we can push that out and make a whole season that has like this sort of like, you know, specific infrastructure that supports bigger ideas. And, you know, the other thing I'll say about that is y'all and I are huge fans of science fiction. We love lore. We love Star Trek. We love Star Wars. We love things that the deeper you go, the more there is for you. And even though we do comedy, we try to do that. So each of our shows has that element. There's tons of Easter eggs. There's so many things in there that if you look, you'll notice it happens. Like, y'all always tells a story about, you know, his character on Charming Showcase is gone for a certain period of time, and Questlove is watching, and Questlove is like, I mean, I don't want to tell the story for you, Diallo, but you want to... No, I mean, Quest was like, yo, is there a reason why your character departed the show for two years at the end of the 70s? Is that the most subtle Lorne Michaels reference of all time? <laughs> I was like, <laughs> man, it is. And yeah. we, we, we always try to make both shows as funny as possible, but we also, like he said, try to throw in, like, just these little things where if you get that that's a reference or a um, or an Easter egg or however, however you want to call it, it's just that extra layer that makes it feel like, yeah, you're, you're in this tent with us. You know, you're one of, I was talking to Fonte the other day about Robert Glasper, who's one of my mm, favorite jazz great, artists. Great, great. I was saying how I wanted him to play Thelonious Monk on the next season of Sherman Showcase. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> and I was like, man, I, I, I just said, I was like, is he one of our people? Like, does he like laugh at like really musically, like deep nerd, deep cuts jokes? You know, like, and he was like, oh, definitely. He's like, we could talk about music for hours. So, you know, whether it's that, or whether like, you know, to go to uh, Southside, like we go deep, deep, deep Chicago cuts on that show. Absolutely. And, uh, mm -hmm. and as, as the one person, I'm literally the only person not from the Midwest involved in the show. If you take out Blyden, I'm the only person not from Chicago specifically. And I should say that all of our series regulars are either, they either grew up on the South Side or they still actively live on the South Side. Like it's, it's crazy house just south side no. like this i sit there in the privileged position of being the one person who didn't grow up there and they'll say something and out in the writer's room and i'll be like yo what did you just say like what that's interesting to me oh i've never heard that before that that's super that must be super chicago let's please mm -hmm. put that in so you know it's, it's just one of those things where we actually use my outsiderness to help sometimes determine like what's that real chicago-ness that we can slip into this there are things in season two which we've already written that I am so proud of in the sense that I think everybody will find it funny, but Chicago people will find it extra funny. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm dying yeah. to shoot the stuff that we're going to shoot for season two. All right, got another question uh, from the people. Um, and I'm summing up, uh, you know, has the pandemic and uh, the, the uprisings with the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, a lot of times comedy can attack serious topics. And since both of these topics affect black people in the South side. Mm. Is there a way that you guys can still bring funny to those situations? It's really, it's really a, a big discussion that we're having now, you know, nothing, nothing in our lifetime has been like coronavirus or these protests and yet nothing lasts forever. And it, it becomes a really big discussion. Like I, I mentioned the Simpsons, I'm a huge fan of the Simpsons. I gotta say the episodes of the Simpsons, that I think have not aged as well are the ones that are really, really specific to 1993 or really specific to a thing that was happening in politics in 1992. You know what I'm saying? It's not bad or good. It's just, does it give the show more longevity? And we want shows that last forever. So does it give our show more longevity if a lot of the season is about coronavirus or does it give the show more longevity if we know that coronavirus and all, like, all things in life come to an end, we don't spend too much time on it because we don't want to have a show where people look back five years and go, why are all these people wearing masks in, in these five episodes yeah. in a row, right? We don't know those answers right now. So as a writer room, again, we're collaborative. We talk to each other. I do think underneath that question is a question about us still trying to be funny and still trying to enjoy life in times like these. And I would say that's something that black people have been great at since there was black people. So I don't think that any yeah. level of hardship or difficulty has ever stopped black people from finding ways to enjoy and uplift each other. And I think that we're really proud to be part of that tradition. So we're going to always be funny, you know, even we're going to ride it to the wheels fall off. But I do think we're actually in an active, you know, we're in an active discussion about how do we address these things, but also not make the show 
not lose the whole second season, you know, for example, through like a coronavirus arc. And it's like, yeah, we just did that. Now, you know, people watching the show on streaming 10 years from now go like, yeah, that whole second season is, I don't know what that's about. Yeah, so it's a discussion. Yeah, it, yeah. Uh, you can feel the, it's, you know, one of my favorite stories is about how when they were shooting Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, both George Lucas and, uh, and uh, Steven Spielberg were going through divorce. And they're like, yeah, there's a reason why that movie is incredibly just, you know, relentlessly it's dark. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a downer. Uh, compared to the other two, and it's because we were in a dark time in our lives. I don't think that we would ever shrink away from something that nope. we thought we could find some humor in. Um, and allow me to make some news, because I don't think it can hurt anything at this point. I think that we're actually in talks of maybe doing something less than a full season of the show, mm -hmm. you know, and, and calling it like season 1.5 or something like that. Yeah, you know, Not maybe, nice. it's just, maybe it's just a uh, a made-for-TV movie or something like that, but yeah, you know, it could be Southside in the time of COVID, and it could be a standalone. Yeah. And by the way, even if we did that, I don't think that we would just make jokes about Zoom calls and masks and all these kind of things. I think we'd probably show the characters somewhere out in the world, you know, and it would be clear it was during COVID. But I think, you know, as 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 big a story as this is, do you spend literally all day talking about it, or? Are there still things that are the same in your life? Are there still some things you know that are that are basic to your life that you still grapple with? I think we would deal deal with it in a, in a very subtle way. And that's because, and that's why it's, I've always said it's impossible, impossible to watch an episode of Murphy Brown in 2020. Hmm. You know, it's like, <laughs> what are you talking, Johnson Nunu jokes? What is this? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> What are you talking about? Saying, like, like we get those, but like everybody don't know those. Like what? This is, you know, everybody knows yeah. Johnson Nunu. Yeah, <laughs> it's like you know, you got to be careful with that stuff. You just it, it's it's you got to be you got to be really you know you got to be careful because you want the show to be forever. Um, you want people to love it forever. Yeah, they're like, well, I wouldn't uh, say I'm Edwin Meech. <laughs> yeah, I think it's me. Uh, I have. <laughs> I think it's me. I ran Contra. <laughs> exactly. I have one question. Uh, one question from me, and uh, Bashir, I asked you this in October. Mm -hmm. I told you my feelings were devastatingly hurt when I realized there was a show called Southside and my phone did not ring. Yeah. You knew this was coming. It was hurt, man. Yeah. I need, to, I need to be a bus driver. Season two, we got be, you. Uh, we got you. Something, man. I, I've Done. been harassing Will Done. Langston. I've been politicking, man. Uh, Will ain't got no, let me tell you, Will ain't got no power. None. <laughs> no, are you still watching? Loop. Stop he's lying to Brian, okay? Stop lying he's, to Brian. He's, he's got willpower. He uh, got willpower. Uh, uh, season two, man, we got you. Bro. Last, Don't worry about it. We got you. Word. Uh, they say, man, I had to kick it the thing. Only thing I want to promote is we're talking about you know people from Chicago doing big things of comedy. Uh, my my best friend Handel Burris put his special mommy nights on YouTube. Shout out, Handel. And uh, oh. and he sort of you know. Did breaking the system versus going on Netflix. He went on YouTube. It's on YouTube now called Miami Nights, one of the best comedy specials out right now. Check it out. Mm. Any last words for you two, Diallo or Bashir? Last words. Uh, City of Chicago, we love you. We had, we were supposed to be there right now, except for the pandemic. Um, and, you know, making the show Southside is the dream of a lifetime. Um, yeah, man. We want to keep making it forever or, you know, as long as they let us. But uh, we want to just thank you guys for your support, man. Thank you, thank you for watching. Thank you for laughing and talking about it. I think, it's the only still, I think you can watch all the episodes on the Comedy Central app. Um, I believe that's the case. If if there's some episodes that aren't on that app, because I know sometimes it changes, it decides to change. We find out. We're the last to know. Um, why didn't they throw? Why didn't they throw you on that Tyler Perry app? That should be because it's all Viacom, man. All gravy. You know, there are many questions I have for Viacom, and this is not the place <laughs> or the time to ask those questions. <laughs> but uh, yes, we have questions. But you know, I think the bottom line is that the fans love the show. And yeah, you can catch it more. definitely yeah. on Amazon. I know on 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 Amazon. I know you got been like one a dollar ninety nine for each episode. But any episodes that aren't on the app are definitely on Amazon. I know that. All right, up, man. It's Brian Babylon for Chicago Ideas Week. Bashir Diallo, I'm so proud of y'all, man. Thank you so much for talking to us. Uh, we'll see you guys on the next go round. Ernest, where you at? Everybody, um, thank you all for joining us today. That was an amazing conversation. Thank you to Bashir. Thank you to Diallo. 
Uh, shout out to Will Miles as well. Congrats on the new baby. Ryan Babylon is the prince of Bronzeville and yep. one of the greatest living Americans. Folks, we really want you to come back and check out what we've been doing since, you know, the world moved online. Essentially, I'd love to, you to go back, if this is your first time watching one of these, to our previous couple of conversations, including one we recently just had with Gia Tolentino and Shea Serrano. That's on demand, and you can find all of this stuff at chicagoideas.com. So go there, check it out, and we hope you enjoyed today's uh, show. Have a good one.